Speaking shortly after his arrival Saturday in Havana, Pope Francis praised the recent rapprochement between Cuba and the United States, in which the Pope played a key role. And he urged them to set an example for the world, which he warned has an atmosphere of, quote, a third world war. Desde hace varios meses, estamos siendo testigos for some months now, we have witnessed an event which fills us with hope, the process of normalizing relations between two peoples following years of estrangement. It's a process. It's a sign of the victory of the culture of encounter and dialogue, the system of universal growth over the forever dead system of groups and dynasties, which José Martí said. I urge political leaders to persevere on this path and to develop all its potentialities as a proof of the high service which they are called to carry out on behalf of the peace and well-being of our peoples, of all America, and as an example of reconciliation for the entire world. The world needs reconciliation in this atmosphere of a third world war. That's Pope Francis when he first arrived in Cuba. He'll come to the United States tomorrow, on Tuesday. Our guest to talk about this in Havana, Carlos Azugaray Treto, a former Cuban diplomat. And here in New York, we're joined by Dr. Andrea Bartole. He's with the community of Saint Egidio, a liberal Catholic group active in international affairs, and is also the dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University in New Jersey. Dr. Andrea Bartole, tell us about your take on the significance of the Pope's visit. First, he chose to go to Cuba. And then he's coming to the United States, and he played a key secret role in the rapprochement between the two, now calling for an end to the embargo. So, first of all, it's very clear that the timing is marvelous. He's, he could have come to the U.S. without going to Cuba. He could have gone to the U.S. first and then to Cuba. Instead, there is his choice of going to Cuba first. Uh, Francis is very clear in his message. He likes peripheries. He wants to see the world through the peripheries. He wants to come to the center of the world from the periphery. So the movement of Francis is very telling. And I think it's a very important moment. He's not only going to Cuba because uh, Cuba is a Catholic country traditionally, because there is a cultural legacy, he speaks Spanish, obviously, in Cuba. But I think because uh, diplomacy is made with encounters, with this challenge of encountering somebody that can be threatening. And the relationship between Cuba and the U.S. has been clearly mutually threatening for quite some time. So, um, Francis is, is trying to say encounter is a challenge, encounter is a risk that you take. And diplomacy must be taken boldly, must be taken with some gusto. And I think that the message that he's saying is that uh, the U.S. is actually ready for this challenge and has done well so far. And can you talk about how the Pope did facilitate this rapprochement, something that wasn't known about until it was announced? Well, well known by some. So, it, it's very interesting, because in many ways, the two parties didn't need Francis at all. They did all the work in Canada, and they did all the work by themselves. So, in many ways, you wonder why did they think that was necessary to go to the Vatican and have this blessing. And I think that there is something about the general perception in the world that serious problem must be solved by war, that serious problem must be solved violently, that serious problem must be solved by victory. And instead, both of them felt that Francis was very important in blessing this idea that serious problem actually must be solved by diplomacy, must be solved politically. So the role of the pope was actually at the very end. It was almost a a blessing, a fatherly blessing of an agreement that was already made by the Americans and the Cubans. Now, this is not the first time a pope has gone to Cuba. You had uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, as well as Pope Benedict. Yes, indeed. It, it, it's a very interesting process, because, as we know now, Bergoglio Cardinal studied uh, Wojtyla's visit very, very carefully. Wojtyla's visit uh, was an important one. This is a—, a, a Pope that was born in uh, Poland, expressed, you know, and lived in his own way, you know, the tragedy of Europe, Nazi Germany occupying Poland, and then the communist 
occupation and the experience, and yet came out victorious because he felt that the church needed to be the church. It needed to be a space for people to think freely. And uh, interestingly enough, his visit to uh, Cuba had similar overtone. The church is not confronting the government, it's not uh, aligning itself against the government, but it's clearly creating conditions for new options to emerge. It's clearly giving the system a possibility to breathe. And uh, Bergoglio clearly is setting himself into this line that Benedict too wanted to strengthen. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> Can you comment on uh, the comments made about the pope by New Jersey governor and Republican presidential hopeful Chris Christie? Christie is Catholic, but speaking to CNN, he said he disagrees with the pope on the U.S.-Cuba relationship. I just think the pope was wrong. Um, and so the, the fact is that um, his infallibility is on religious matters, not on political ones. Um, and the fact is that, for me, um, I just believe that when you have a government that is harboring fugitives, murdering fugitives, like Joanne Chesimar, who murdered a state policeman in New Jersey in cold blood, was broken out of prison and has been harbored for the last 40 plus years by a Cuban government that has paid her and held her up as a hero, that this president could extend um, diplomatic relations with that country without getting her returned so that she can serve the prison sentence that she was sentenced to by a jury of her peers in New Jersey is outrageous. And so I, I just happen to disagree with the Pope on this one. Mm, that is Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. You are at Seton Hall University. Uh, you're the head of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations. You're the dean of it. Seton Hall is in East Orange, New Jersey. Your response to Governor Christie. So the governor Christie is right. The Pope is infallible only on matters of faith and when he speaks ex cathedra. So on that point is very clear. But the question is, should we keep countries uh, frozen in a 50 years uh, relationship that doesn't go anywhere? Uh, the fugitive that uh, Governor Christie mentioned is not in New Jersey, and he's not going to be in New Jersey anytime soon if the policy of the U.S. remains the same. So the result of that policy is that uh, justice, according to New Jersey law, was definitely not served. Do we have a chance that that justice will be served if there is an agreement between the U.S. and Cuba? I would say that is certainly much higher. So in a world of probability, I would say that actually the Pope is right, in a sense that even the justice that Governor Christie is claiming will actually be probably better served by a collaboration between the government of Cuba and the government of the United States. Uh, I wanted to ask you about his trip to the United States and the significance of this, and uh, the priest who will be sanctifying here when he first comes to Washington, D.C. So, Junipero Rosera is clearly a, an interesting presence in the U.S. He's a Spanish-speaking missionary, and his memory is very fond in certain quarters, but he's also debated. And I think it's important for people to realize that the debate within the Catholic Church has been around for quite some time. Uh, we celebrated a few years ago 500 years of the Montesinos uh, homilies, you know, these famous words in which these Dominican friars was condemning the uh, Spanish conquistadores uh, to against, you know, their, their oppression of the natives. And Las Casas and the others clearly po put that emphasis into play. So the Catholic Church has been thinking this contradiction for quite some time. And interestingly enough, the Jesuit themselves found in Latin America a very interesting history of experimenting with politics that the European monarchy couldn't accept. So I think that what we are seeing here is the uh, long end of a long history. And the uh, Catholic Church has been around for quite some time. The Pope Francis's decision to canonize um, Father Serra has drawn a strong protest from many Native Americans. They accuse—they uh, say that the, in the 18th century, the Franciscan missionary was brutal, um, imposing conversion to uh, Catholicism. This is Corrine Fairbanks, director of Southern California chapter of the American Indian Movement or AIM? I think that Sarah was a, um, you know, an accomplice and a co-conspirator to uh, rape, land theft, torture, murder. Um, 
I think that he's just as bad as uh, Hitler. Um, I mean, some people might not understand the comparison, but he was a man with a vision and kept nothing, nothing uh, in the way of making that vision happen. Didn't care how many thousands of people that he hurt. He had a vision, he had a plan, he executed it. Dr. Andrea Bartoli, um, your response. I interestingly, uh, the Pope has condemned colonialism, has apologized to indigenous and Native American people. Yeah, exactly. So, this is a very interesting challenge for the Catholic Church more than anyone else, you know, of being a presence in human history for more than 2,000 years. And so, clearly, you have contradictions and acts that were wrong and for which the Church has apologized. Uh, the Pope himself, uh, especially John Paul II, started this uh, expression uh, of contrition. But I also think that it's important to realize how the debates within the Church were alive at that time and were still alive, and also how the political realities of that moment, you know, the secular forces were pushing for even further oppression and extermination. So I think that uh, the choices that we make today are clearly making the world as we leave it, but it's important to realize that uh, the ways in which we remember is also counting. I wanted to go back to Dr. Carlos Alzugaray Treto uh, in Havana, in Cuba, <clears throat> and ask you about Asada Shakur, who uh, um, Governor Christie was talking about. Uh, Asada Shakur, who was known, who was uh, born as Joanne Chesimard, uh, was convicted May 2, 1973, of killing a New Jersey state trooper during a shootout that left one of her fellow activists dead on the New Jersey Turnpike. Um, she was shot twice by the New Jersey um, uh, police during the incident. In 79, she managed to escape from jail. She later, later fled to Cuba. And she has long proclaimed her innocence, but said she could not get a fair trial in the United States. Is it possible that um, her exile is threatened uh, under this rapprochement, Dr. Tretto? Um, the, the Cuban government has been very clear on this issue. Uh, they have insisted again and again that Joan Chesimar or Ashata Sakur is a, pol a political exile. It's considered a political exile by the Cuban government. Um, of course, Governor Christie, it's, it's only normal that he would have that opinion. But I, I would invite him to, to think about these things, because, I mean, if we are going to stop the normalization process because of these kinds of issues, the Cuban government can say, why don't, uh, doesn't the United States extradite to Cuba Luis Posada Carriles? whose case is even worse, even than the one that Christie describes about Asata Shakur, um, Luis Posada Carriles is a terrorist, and he has confessed to uh, major crimes. He's not—he was tried and convicted in Venezuela, tried and convicted in Panama, but in Panama he was pardoned by the influence of the right-wing Cuban Americans, and he's in the United States, and the United States hasn't processed him for his terrorist activities, or even though the in, internal documents, it is recognized that he's a violent terrorist, and he's not extradited. Now, the Cuban government could say, well, I, I, I am not going to talk to the American government until they extradite Posada Carriles. They don't say that, because the, the, the logical thing is for these issues to be debated diplomatically and to be talked about diplomatically. It's a reality, unfortunately, it's a reality of our long conflict, but Cuba stands on, on, its, on its position that she is a political—she uh, uh, came to Cuba asking for political asylum, and she was given political asylum by the Cuban government. Finally, this—I um, don't know if it was a rumor, um, but the, uh, the possibility that the pope would have come up to the United States through the Mexican border. Uh, Dr. Bartolé, what do you know about this? Well, I think it's a wonderful gesture, and I think that it's definitely possible that Francis had considered that. You know, you, we all remember him at the wall, uh, and I think that it's, it's important for Francis to realize that uh, his presence and his politics is not just made by speeches, it's also made by gestures, and he's actually 
becoming more known in many ways in this global age uh, through these gestures. I think that uh, we also need to remember that American cardinals went to the wall, you know, to the border, you know, to celebrate uh, Cardinal O'Malley, who is fluent in Spanish and fluent in Portuguese and has been a very strong defender of the rights of the immigrant, already did this. So, for the Catholic Church, that border is particularly relevant because as we can imagine, you know, Catholics are everywhere, are clearly very strong in the U.S., but very strong in Mexico, too. So it would have been a wonderful gesture, and it's interesting that it could not happen. Finally, Sant'Egidio, um, the community that you represent, um, we only have a minute, but can you explain how this relates to the Pope and what this community of liberal Catholic service does? So, in this particular case, the community is the largest movement of Catholics in uh, Cuba, and it's growing quite remarkably, being born in Rome in 1968, his presence in the United States, and has been working on peacemaking for a long time. I'm representing the community to the U.N. because we were involved in the peace process in Mozambique. We have been involved in Albania, in Algeria, in many countries. And we're working now on Syria. So the Comitio Sant'Egidio is the beginning of a new church after Vatican II. It's the expression of a new Catholic understanding of the world. And this is why we feel that Francis is so important, not just for Catholic, but for everyone. And in Syria, you are doing what? In Syria, we, call, we, we gather all the non-armed Syria opposition, and we have been working with the Mistura on the new concept and the new ideas on ways in which diplomacy could address the issue. Uh, our presence in Syria has been, especially through the Christians in the uh, territory, uh, one in particular, two bishops uh, and one Catholic priest. Uh, uh, Mar Gregorius Ibrahim and Paul Yazici, uh, Syrian Orthodox and uh, um, Orthodox, uh, Greek Orthodox uh, bishop and Paolo Dall'Oglio, uh, all kidnapped, uh, have been in our prayers every day since their kidnapping. The committee has been uh, dedicated to Syria from all over the world. And I think it's very, very important to realize that we definitely feel the lacking of a peace movement worldwide for peace in Syria. It's just outrageous what is happening there and the lack of response that we have. Mm. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us, and I'd like to continue the conversation at another time with you about uh, San Egidio's work all over the world. Dr. Andrea Bartole is the representative of the community of San Egidio, a liberal Catholic group active in international affairs, dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations, as well, at Seton Hall University, and Carlos Azugaray Treto, a former Cuban diplomat, speaking to us directly from Havana, Cuba. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. War and Peace Report. When we come back, we look at racial relations over the last 50 years, but particularly focusing in the last years around President Obama and the Clintons. We'll speak with Joy Ann Reed, author and MSNBC correspondent, about her book called Fracture. Stay with us.